Well, um, I want to uh, uh, begin by telling you a story uh, this morning um, about a, a young man named Cuthbert. Um, some of you uh, will have heard me tell a story about a man called Cuthbert uh, before. This is a different uh, Cuthbert, but I always think Cuthbert is a safe name to use because uh, I know none of you are called uh, Cuthbert, um, or, or probably nobody that you know either. Uh, but let me tell you about uh, Cuthbert. Cuthbert lived in uh, the underworld where everything was in complete darkness. Uh, nobody could see anything. And the effects of that were evident everywhere. Uh, in order to get around from place to pa- place, uh, Cuthbert, just like everybody else, had to fumble around in the darkness, had to feel his way around. And because it was all uh, so dark all the time, it was really hard to make sense of anything. In fact, it was pretty chaotic. Everyone seemed to have uh, this mindset that basically said, uh, the most important thing is to make sure that you are okay. Don't worry about everybody else. Uh, Look after number one. It didn't really matter how many things got broken uh, or how many other people got hurt while you were, while you were feeling your way around in the underworld. Uh, as long as you got to your chosen destination, uh, that was all that mattered. In this darkness, in this underworld, people got up to all sorts of sordid, evil, grotesque things. Uh, and Cuthbert uh, was no different. Life in the, in, the, in the underworld, life in the dark was, was hard. I mean, what was the point of even existing in the darkness? People became very depressed. Life seemed so pointless. People tried all sorts of different things to, to try and find a sense of meaning or a sense of, of purpose. Um, many thought that uh, education, education... And education was uh, the answer. That would be what would solve things. But when that didn't work, uh, they tried other things. Maybe some dedicated themselves to getting rich, having comfort and luxury. Even in the darkness, they sought to find ways to give themselves uh, comfort. But that didn't work either. Many people in this underworld tried other things like um, drugs, Alcohol, uh, relationships, sex. Some thought that identity was the key to finding some way out of the darkness. But alas, whatever people tried, whatever, wherever people sought to find a sense of enlightenment, the darkness just felt even darker. All of it essentially resulted in people having a a, a motto which was basically live for the moment. They wallowed in their darkness, the people in the underworld. Their their conduct got darker and darker. So did Cuthbert's. If Cuthbert ever showed any signs of feeling bad about the grotesque things that he did, Uh, the other people in the underworld would would tell him to stop being so stupid. They told him there was no ultimate standard to uh, to live your life by anyway, so that he should just satisfy himself with whatever cravings he had. Because one day his pointless existence would be over, uh, and that would be that. One day, uh, Cuthbert bumped into a a group of people, uh, and they called themselves people of the light. They said that the underworld wasn't supposed to be dark. Apparently, they they, they said it it hadn't always been this way. But that the darkness that existed in people's lives was what had ultimately caused everything to be so dark. They said that there was someone who could show them everything one who could help them see that living in the darkness could be avoided. Now, most people hated 
these uh, people of the light. They called them losers. Uh, they called them party poopers. They called them do-gooders. But Cuthbert was drawn to these people. There was something about them. And he was drawn to find out more. You see, the people of the light, they spoke about a special person. Now, we'll call this special person Jesus. They said that Jesus was the light. They said that by following him, uh, they were able to see where they were going. They also said that he was going to take them to be with him in the light. In a place that was full of light, where actually there was no darkness at all. In fact, in fact, Cuthbert was told that in order to make that possible, this Jesus had actually been down to the underworld himself. They said that Jesus was the one who made the underworld. When he had seen how dark things were and how much of a mess the people had made of things, how confused they were, how broken they were, this Jesus had come down into the mess, into the underworld. And he had told people that he was the light. But largely, these people hated him for it. This Jesus had told people that, that they could receive light by simply following him. They hated him so much for this that they, they killed him. They didn't like having their darkness exposed by the light. Anyway, the people uh, of the light told Cuthbert that despite the fact that this Jesus had been killed by the people of darkness, actually that he'd come back to life. And the reason they said for that was that light overcomes darkness. And they said that even now, Jesus was able to change people's lives, giving them meaning, giving them purpose, and forgiving them for all their darkness and giving them light. Now, let me tell you, Cuthbert loved what he heard about this man. Uh, he thought, what a hero this man sounds like. What a hero. Uh, to come down into the underworld to give light to people like him. <coughs> Cuthbert believed in Jesus. And from that moment... He could see. Things made sense. Now, there was, there was no more stumbling around. There was no more fumbling around. Cuthbert was able to see everything. He was able to see where he was going. He was able to make sense of life. He was also able to see how grotesquely he had been living before, while he'd been in the darkness. He, he'd, he'd done things like uh, telling lies. He'd been selfish. He'd been really proud. He disobeyed his parents. He lusted after women. All of these things, Cuthbert could see clearly, actually were dark. They were things that had made his heart even darker. But he also found that with the help of this man, Jesus, he was able to start living in a way which reflected the light. He started meeting together with the uh, people of the light. He loved that. He absolutely loved it. They would spend time learning more about this man, uh, Jesus, and how they could become more like him. Uh, the people he started meeting with, they called themselves God's new community, the church. Let's call them Newtown Evangelical Church. 
Now that, my friends, is a story that I've made up. But it's very much based on a true story. About a real man who was also called Jesus. He's the one that we encounter again in John's Gospel, in the passage that uh, Gareth read for us. Uh, We see Jesus uh, here in John chapter 8 speaking to a a group of people, telling them about himself. Now we see a wonderful note of hope at the end of the passage uh, that that was read. If you look at the uh, end of the passage, uh, chapter 8, verse 30, there are these words, and they're wonderful words. It says, even as he spoke, many believed in him. See, the reason uh, this is, is good news, essential news, is that because a little bit earlier than that, in verse 24, Jesus says this. He says, if you do not believe that I am he, you will indeed die in your sins. See, belief in Jesus is essential for life and light. Now, verse 30 has been repeated millions and millions and millions of times over the past 2,000 years. I wonder this morning, have you believed in Jesus? Have you believed in him? I just want us to to notice three things from the passage uh, this morning. Uh, We'll dip back into Cuthbert's situation as we go along, but um, let's just notice three things that Jesus uh, says. Uh, We're going to look at what he says about himself what he says about his followers, and what he says about his enemies. Okay, so firstly, what Jesus says of himself. Now, these are truly wonderful words from uh, Jesus, aren't they? Jesus said, I am the light of the world. Uh, These words from Jesus, they show us that, um, like the underworld that we were just thinking about, uh, the world that we live in, is dark. It is dark. It's in need of light. Our world is both morally and spiritually in utter darkness. And here, Jesus Christ declares himself to be the remedy. Light is is hugely symbolical throughout uh, the Old Testament. Um, Psalm 27 verse 1 says this, The Lord is my light and my salvation. If you were to to read through the Old Testament, you can come across all sorts of passages where this this imagery of God being light is is used. So passages in Isaiah, Ezekiel, Habakkuk, Zechariah, they all point to Yahweh, God, Jehovah, being the light for his people. And now here, before the, uh, the Jewish people of the day and before us here in Newtown Evangelical Church, uh, Jesus Christ declares, I am the light of the world. He doesn't say, um, I am a light. I am one of many lights. No, the light. Jesus Christ doesn't say, I am a remedy. He is the only remedy. Now, light has has an incredible power, doesn't it? It's got an an incredible quality. It doesn't matter how dark it is, does it? It doesn't matter how pitch black it might be. Light always penetrates the darkness. You turn the light on, the darkness flees. Light has many functions. Uh, it, um, it reveals hidden things, doesn't it? It leads the way. Light illuminates. Light shows you the truth of what is really there. You might think you know what's there. You, I mean, maybe you've driven through somewhere. I think, I think someone said, did you say this the other day? You, you'd driven somewhere, it was dark, and you don't have a clue what that place looks like. Bishop's Castle, maybe. 
That was it. Yeah, Catherine went to Bishop's Castle. She hasn't got a clue what it looks like because it was dark. So one day you'll go there and you'll see what's really there. Um, I hear it's quite nice. Anyway, um, Jesus is saying, are you confused as to the meaning of life? Come to me. Come to me. I can reveal it to you. Are you lost? Come to me, says Jesus. I can lead the way. More than that, I am the way. Are you shrouded in darkness? Is there a heavy cloud hanging over you? Come to me. I can give you light. More than that, I am the light. Forget about religion. Forget about philosophy. Don't try and work out the meaning of life for yourself, says Jesus. Come to me and find life and light. I made you, says Jesus. Your life has purpose. You're not an accident. No matter what people might try and tell you, come into the light, says Jesus. See, once you've seen me, you'll see everything. Everything else makes sense. Stop trying to satisfy yourself in all manner of ways. Stop trying to search within for your true identity. It's the buzzword of today, isn't it? Stop your self-help programs. Stop it. They are doing nothing other than leading you into deeper and deeper darkness. Come to me, says Jesus. Come to me and be satisfied. Come into the light. Stop trying to cover up your sin. Stop. Stop trying to find ways of excusing your sin. Stop carrying that load of guilt and shame at the way that you've been living your life. Now come to me, says Jesus. I lived on this planet for 33 years or so and I, I met the standard required so that you don't have to. I have paid the penalty for your sin. Come to me. Let my light shine into your darkness and set you free from its power. You don't have to have sin having power over you any longer. Says Jesus, come to me. Now back in our, uh, our story, one of the uh, objections uh, that people in the underworld had uh, about this Jesus that was being talked about was, who does he think he is? that he can tell us how we should live. And that's exactly what we see here in John chapter 8. See, Jesus tells the Pharisees and the, the, those hearing him uh, that he is the light of the world, that whoever follows him will never walk in darkness. And the Pharisees respond by saying, hang on a second, who are you? <laughs> who do you think you are? Anyone can make a claim like that. What authority have you got? It's a kind of a paraphrase of the Pharisees' response. It seems like a good question, doesn't it? Somebody comes and makes bold claims about themselves, uh, you, uh, you might ask that question. If you started making bold claims uh, about what authority you had to do such a thing, I would question it. Let's just say you, uh, you went uh, to London uh, tomorrow and uh, you... Uh, rocked up at 10 Downing Street and knocked on the door. Let's just say that uh, you managed to get there. Um, security were asleep. And uh, you spoke to Ricky, Rishi Sunak. Uh, and you said to Rishi, um, Rishi, I've got good news for you. Um, I'd like to, uh, to offer you a free trade agreement with the United States of America. Well, Rishi Sunak would rightly uh, shut the door in your face, uh, and he would have you removed very quickly. He'd wake up the security, and you'd be gone. But let's just say you went to London tomorrow, and you knocked on the door, and you said to Rishi Sunak, 
I've got good news. I am the ambassador of the United States to the United Kingdom, and I speak on behalf of Joe Biden. And we'd like to offer the UK a free trade deal. Well, that changes everything, doesn't it? Those words now have authority because they're speaking on behalf of the President of the United States. Okay, says Jesus. I have, I don't claim to have any authority of human origin. At least uh, seven times in this passage, Jesus declares that he is from the Father, that he speaks on behalf of the Father, that he is going to the Father. I don't speak on behalf of other men, says Jesus. Uh, I speak from God. He goes further. He says, I speak, I speak for God. Actually, says Jesus, I speak as God. See, Jesus makes it clear that he does nothing on his own. His authority is of heavenly origin. See, when Jesus says, I am the light of the world, that is because that is precisely what he is. So that's what Jesus says about himself. Let's look uh, briefly now at what Jesus says about those who follow him. See, Cuthbert, uh, through the witness of the, the, the people of the light, uh, he uh, he came to believe in Jesus, and many others did the same. And instantly, their experience of the underworld transformed completely. And, and there were certain things that now became true of Cuthbert once he believed in, in Jesus. And there are things that um, John 8 tells us are true of all of the followers of Jesus Christ. The first thing to say is this. We follow Jesus. We follow Jesus. So what does that mean? Does it just mean we, we tick the Christian box on the census when it comes around once every 10 years? Does it mean that we, uh, we go to church? Is that, is that what it means to follow Jesus? Or we subscribe to a particular belief system uh, a helpful picture we, is one that's found back in, in, in the Old Testament, in Exodus. In Exodus, God was leading his people out of slavery in Egypt. Uh, and you can read of it in Exodus 13 and, and 14, this particular element. And it, in Exodus 13, verse 21 and 22, we read these words. It says, And the Lord went before them by day in a pillar of cloud to lead them along the way, and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light that they might travel by day and by night. The pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night did not depart from before the people. So to be led out of slavery, uh, the Israelites literally followed the pillar of cloud by day and fire by night. That's what Jesus' followers do. They literally follow him. They follow Jesus. Why? Well, because he's the only hope. He is the way, the truth, and the life. He is the light of the world. And the result of following Jesus? Well, here's a wonderful truth. Jesus says, whoever follows me will never walk in darkness. See, that confusion, that ignorance, that doubt, that uncertainty that once shrouded our, our minds, it's gone. It's gone forever. Uh, as a commentator, I often mention uh, J.C. Ryle. 
expository thoughts on the Gospels, get them. Um, but uh, he, says, he says this. He shall, he shall not be left in ignorance like the many around him. He shall not grope in doubt and uncertainty, but shall see the way to heaven and know where he is going. That's the follower of Jesus. Now, just as Cuthbert could now see where he was going in the, uh, in the underworld, uh, the same reality rings true for the Christian. Everything makes sense now. I don't just see who Jesus is. I can see by that light, I can see everything else. There's a wonderful hymn that we're going to sing in a short while, uh, and it, uh, it contains these words. It says, uh, heaven above is softer blue. Earth around is sweeter green. Something lives in every hue Christless eyes have never seen. Birds with gladder songs or flow, flowers with deeper beauty shine. Since I know as now I know, I am his and he is mine. There's a beauty that we see in everything which we simply cannot see without the light of the gospel. And the other thing to say is, when we follow him, we, we have him. See, Jesus says, I, I am the light. Notice that. Jesus says, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will have the light. The light of life. Again, this is precious truth, isn't it? It's helpful, I think, to notice the connection between light and life. Now, cast your eyes back uh, to uh, the start of our series in John, John chapter 1, verse 4. It says this, In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. See, the life, we read, gives light. The life gives light. See, by our nature, the Bible tells us we are dead. We're blind to the light. Ephesians 2, verse verse 1, you were dead in your trespasses and sins. But when when we are made alive, as Paul goes on to say in Ephesians 2, when we receive that life by the power of the Holy Spirit of God. We, we receive light. We're able to see. Uh, we, are, we are able to have the light of life. And that light is able to guide us through all circumstances that come our way in life. And ultimately, it's able to, to guide us all the way to an eternity with our Savior in heaven. And Cuthbert, remember, he wasn't able to see a thing. Everything was dark until he was made alive. He believed in Jesus. He received the light of life. He became one of the people of the light. Now, is that you this morning? Are you walking in the light? See, what a joy and a privilege it is if you're able to answer that question by saying yes. What a joy. See, if that includes you, you, my friend, you have the light of life. Now, let me encourage you, walk in it. Walk in the light. Don't walk in darkness. See, while we're here on earth, The reality is that we continue to be surrounded by darkness, don't we? Even as people of the light, and it can sometimes feel as though that darkness is closing in. See, our friend uh, Cuthbert, he he had times when the darkness around him really appeared to be closing in on him. And the people of the darkness, of the underworld, they told him he'd been conned. They told him that there was no such thing as light. Light to stop fooling himself. Maybe that's something you can relate to. See, there can be times, can't there, even as a follower of Jesus, 
when we can be caused to doubt his goodness. When the path we're, we're treading causes us to really sincerely ask whether his path for us is indeed good, whether it is indeed the right path. Now, there was an American pastor in the, the, the uh, early 20th century. His name was Victor Raymond Edmund, And he once said this. He said, never doubt in the darkness what God has shown you in the light. Never doubt in the darkness what God has shown you in the light. See, friends, circumstances change. God never changes. Walk in the light. Trust him. Trust him to guide you through life. So that's what Jesus says about his followers. But finally, as we close, uh, let's just uh, look at what Jesus says of his enemies. You see, our friend Cuthbert, as I said, he, he did indeed continue to walk in the light. He, he didn't believe that he'd been conned. All followers of Jesus do. All f- true followers of Jesus continue in the light. But Cuthbert despaired at the unwillingness of those around him to receive the same light that he had. Now, we know the same despair, don't we? And it's those people uh, that much of what Jesus has to say in the rest of this passage relates to. In verses 14 to 19, Jesus uh, essentially declares to the Pharisees that despite all of their self-confidence, despite all of their perceived wisdom, all of their religion, they were completely ignorant towards God. All of the head knowledge in the world will count for nothing if you don't know Jesus, the light of the world. But the most critical truth about the enemies of Jesus, and and let's get this clear this morning, let me be absolutely clear, if you're not a friend, if you're not a follower of Jesus, then that is what you are, you're an enemy of Jesus. There's no third category. You can't be neutral. If you're not a follower, you are an enemy. And the most critical truth that Jesus lays before us from these verses, I think it's found in verse 24, and I mentioned it earlier on. And it says this, where Jesus is speaking, and he says, if you do not believe that I am he, you will indeed die in your sins. If you don't believe in Jesus, that is your lot. You will die in your sins. Your guilt, your shame, your filth, all of it will go with you to the grave. And, my friend, it will drag you down to hell. In verse 21, Jesus says, Where I go, you cannot come. I'm going to be with my Father in heaven, says Jesus. But your sins bar you from coming with me. If you fail to believe in me, you will die in your sins. Now, maybe you think this is a bit harsh. Maybe you think Jesus is just uh, scaremongering. Who does he think he is, damning people to hell? Isn't he supposed to be full of love? Doesn't sound very loving, does it? Well, again, J.C. Weil, I found very, very helpful uh, here, because he comments this. Who is this that speaks of men dying in their sins, unpardoned, unforgiven, unfit to meet God, of men going into another world with all of their sins upon them? He that says this is no other than the saviour of mankind who laid down his life for his sheep, the loving, gracious, merciful, compassionate friend of sinners. It is Christ himself. See, friends, let me tell you, Jesus is no scaremonger. He is a loving saviour who longs that you will not perish in your sins. 
He longs to be your saviour. A man who knows that a swamp is infested with crocodiles and who stands on the bank of that swamp pleading with people not to go for a swim. He is no scaremonger. (laughs) He's a lifesaver. See, friends, if you continue to reject the light of life, you will die in your sins. You will stand before God with no hope. Your charity giving, uh, your meals on wheels, your church attendance, your good deeds, they will count for nothing. But there stands Jesus, and his arms are outstretched wide. And he is saying, come to me. Come to me. Follow me. Come into the light. Come as you are. Bring your sin. Bring your filth. Bring your shame. I've paid for it all at the cross of Calvary. Come out of the darkness, says Jesus. Come into my most wonderful light. Now again, the the, the wonderfully encouraging thing for us, we said it at the outset, is that even after all those words, verse 30, at the end of the passage says, even as he spoke, many believed in him. See, Jesus is able to transform lives, friends. Even as we've been here this morning, even as his word has been going out, it's possible for you to have been brought from darkness into light. See, Cuthbert, well, he stayed walking in the light and eventually he grew old. Eventually he died and he left the underworld. At that very moment, he met Jesus who welcomed him into his eternal home where there was no darkness at all. Heaven. When Jesus spoke again to the people, he said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Let's pray. Our Father, we praise you and thank you for these wonderful words of Jesus. We thank you that whoever follows Jesus will never walk in darkness. And we thank you that that includes many of us here this morning. Father, we pray that you'd help us to be those who do indeed walk in the light. But Father, we uh, pray for those who at present are still walking in darkness. Father, we pray that those sober words from Jesus would wake them up, would help them to see that unless they believe in Jesus, unless they accept that light, they will die in their sins. We thank you that Jesus is mighty to save. We thank you that his arms, are even now, are outstretched, ready to receive sinners. We pray that each person in this room this morning would know that they are safe in those arms. In Jesus' name, amen.